Does anybody recognize where this is? Jace, you have been here. Uh, that's that's uh, the EDSA Highway in uh, Manila, Philippines. Uh, my wife is from the Philippines, and so our talk today is going to be on locking with Pearl. And uh, so kind of when I am thinking of locking, I'm thinking of race conditions, and there's almost no place on earth better for race conditions than, uh, than the EDSA Highway in Manila, Philippines. So anyway, uh, locking with Pearl, hard things should be possible. Uh, and my name is Dave Oswald, uh, and you know, here I am. Uh, I'd like to thank Endurance and Bluehost for letting me be here. That's my employer, and I'd like to also thank the Pearl community for making uh, the Pearl Conference possible and for making our careers possible. Uh, and I'd like to thank my family for letting me come too. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're here to talk about locking with Pearl, not my family. Uh, what is file locking anyway? Uh, file locking, what is that? Uh, a lot of people who have encountered file locking have encountered it this way. Uh, if you can read any of those, uh, this action can't be completed because the folder or file is open in another program or uh, something went wrong. Uh, this file is locked for editing. Uh, this is kind of how the general public uh, is exposed to file locking. Uh, those, that, those that recognize what they're being exposed to, a lot of times it's just they're exposed to corrupt data. So uh, locking is intended to solve several difficult problems. Uh, one of the problems that, we, that it's intended to solve is corruption, data corruption, collisions, right? Race conditions. Uh, so let's talk about race conditions a little bit. What is a race condition? Um, well, a race condition is when uh, multiple competitors uh, are competing for the same prize, right? Uh, or multiple entities competing for the same resource, if we're thinking in terms of computing. If we want to get more specific, maybe multiple processes competing for the same file. Uh, Multiple web hits com competing for the same database. Uh, multi com multiple consumers competing for a singleton process or object. Uh, another one, multiple threads competing for the same memory, object, or data. So why are race conditions a problem? You can answer if you want. It's, you don't have to. I'm just. It's a rhetorical question, but people feel free to speak up because that makes this a lot more fun. Um, I found this quote and I just loved it when I saw it because I thought immediately, hey, this is race conditions. In eternity there is no time, only an instant long enough for a joke. Well, it turns out that between every line of code, there's an eternity that exists. But it's just long enough for a bad joke, right? Uh, so why are race con conditions a problem? Because an instant in computing really is an eternity. Uh, you can get file corruption, you can get uh, resources can, be dis can disappear or be rewritten out from under us, ownership or permission can change, uh, context can change, the entire, the whole world can change out from under us, especially on larger scale computing where there's a lot of servers involved or a lot of users involved, uh, a lot of different processes trying to hit the same thing. The universe can change out from under us. So why are race conditions a problem? Because really all bets are off. It's anybody's guess what can happen. And in programming, we don't like to guess. We kind of prefer certainty. We depend on deterministic outcomes. But in the case of race conditions, it's uh, from the perspective of the, of the software that's running, it's really a non-deterministic type of thing that's happening to us. So we have to assume that an eternity of bad jokes exists between each line of code. And uh, this might be a good opportunity to look at an example of a race. So let me bump this up in size. Is that legible? Good? Okay. One more? How's that? Good? So, I would like to make this a little simpler, but I'm generating a race condition in code intentionally. So the first thing that I'm doing is I have a file that we're all gonna compete for. 
and it's called race output. And I'm going to allow, I, I, I say I'm allowing five processes, but we're really only going to, we're going to spin off three forks. And I, I've got three lists. I have a list of numbers, a list of letters, and a list of emoticons, or emoji, or emoji whatever you want to call them nowadays. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is for each of my numbers, letters, and emoticons, I'm going to spin off a process using Parallel Fork Manager. I'm going to sleep for a small amount of random time, a fraction of a second, and then I'm going to open up an output file in a pin mode, and I'm going to write to it. I'm going to write the entire list of elements to that file. So if you look at just that for each loop, it looks pretty simple. It's just spitting out a bunch of elements all in, in a row, and we opened up a file. But really, the uh, fly in the ointment here is that we're doing it inside of a subprocess, a fork. And we have three forks, or three, three subprocesses. Then we close up the file handle, and we finish our process, and we wait for all the children to finish. And then we're going to go ahead and print out uh, what we ended up getting in, in our output file. And we'll see what we got. So, oops. And this will take a few seconds because I put some random sleeps in here or there to simulate the eternities of real life in computing. But as you can see here, my list of letters, my list of emoji, and my list of numbers are kind of interspersed. And if we were to scroll back, you'd see that it really isn't in any particular order. I guess I'm having a little trouble scrolling back, so we won't do that. Oh, maybe I can do it if I move my mouse over. Here we go. There we go. Sometimes you'll have letter, number, emoji. Sometimes you'll have no emoji, letter, number. It's not really in any, in any predictable order, a deterministic outcome, or non-deterministic outcome. So let's go back and talk again. Uh, so we can assume that an eternity of bad jokes exists between each line of code in that code that I showed, where we were writing to the output file. Apparently Google thinks I'm talking to it. Sorry. Okay, let's talk about Perl's flock. Or put it that way. That's, that's a flock of camels, in case you can't tell in the back row there. Um, so here is a very simple example of using flock on an input file. At the beginning, we use F control uh, and we import some, uh, some uh, constants that we're going to use. And then we go ahead and we, uh, let's see here if I can get my mouse. Okay, here we're importing some, cons uh, some constants. Here we're gonna go ahead and open a file in input mode and then we're gonna lock the file we're going to get a shared lock on it. And so that's, that's a very simple example of using flock or using Perl's locking. And now our goal is to narrow eternity down to an atomic operation from the perspective of our program. Uh, we can only do that virtually. We can't change time, how time works. So in concurrent programming, an operation or set of operations is atomic. Let's discuss what atomic is. Uh, is atomic or linearizable or indivisible or uninterruptible if it appears to the rest of the system to occur instantaneously. So atomicity is a guarantee of isolation from concurrent processes. It turns out it's a little bit hard to get any kind of a real guarantee in life uh, and in computing, but, uh, but we're going to talk about what atomic things are. So what is an atom? An atom is something that uh, up until uh, a century ago wasn't very well understood, up until even 60, 70, 80 years ago wasn't terribly well understood. Dalton's atomic theory was that atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. And so if you want to work with me a little bit, that's what we're going to, uh, that's, that's the concept of an atom that we're going to work with. So atoms cannot be split, they cannot be subdivided, um, and you'll have, to, you'll have to work with me because that, we're going we're gonna to assume the pre-atomic era, right? Um, so there are a few operations which actually are atomic. Rename, Perl's rename is atomic. Uh, unlink is atomic. Open is atomic. These things happen just all at once uh, in one, one system call, as you would say. But 
but then what? You're, what can you do with just a rename or just an unlink or just an open? That, you haven't accomplished really anything. Uh, we need a way of turning multiple lines of code into one atomic operation or into one atom. We need a way to suspend eternity for a, for a moment. Uh, anybody know who that is? A few people, okay. So this is, yeah, this is MJ, Mark Jason Dominus, and some elements of this discussion have been borrowed from, uh, from a talk of his that he gave back in about 2001, I think, or 2002. Uh, and so I wanna give proper credit where credit's due. Uh, so file locking, uh, in fact, I actually stole this little picture from his slides. That's, that's why I wanted to give attribution. Uh, file locking is like a traffic light. Only one direction has a green light at the same time, and only one process has an exclusive lock at a time. To achieve locking, first we need some con to import some constants, and I'll explain those in just a minute. And then we need to make our call to flock. And we pass to flock a file handle right there. And we pass it one of these constants that we've imported using this module here. So lock ex. And then if we don't get our lock, we're going to die for whatever, if we don't get our lock for whatever reason. So You can also, we would call this lock up here, this lock EX, an exclusive lock, and we would call it a blocking lock. Uh, Perl will wait, actually the system call will wait essentially forever until we obtain our file lock. If we wanted to return immediately, we can OR in another component to our, uh, to the constants that we pass into flock and we're going to OR in lock NB, non-blocking. But if we ask for a non-blocking lock, that's what we're going to get. We're going to, we're going to try to lock and then we're going to return immediately whether or not we have a lock. And you can check the exit code of your flock call or the return value of your flock call to decide if you actually got the lock. So if flock, I have a lock, and if not, I don't. And, you, and it's up to you to react however you would like to. So let's look at uh, a little bit of flocking in action. So use F control with importing the constants, and then we're going to uh, open up a file handle in uh, read plus write mode. Uh, we give it a file name, and we're going to die if we can't open, and then we're going to try to get an exclusive lock on this file, and then we're going to die if we can't get the lock. So there is, it turns out, an eternity of time between the open and the flock. But it doesn't, in this particular case, it's, that's okay because we're going to just open the flock and presumably maybe we'll, well, we're going to read and modify the data. And then when we're done, we're releasing the lock with lock un, you see there. And what have we achieved? Well, we made a great achievement. What did we just achieve? We got an atomic operation. So let's talk for just a moment about lock modes and then we can circle back and see why this isn't quite as easy as it looked the first time around. Um, first of all, I, t I keep talking about these constants that we import from F control. What does that even stand for? File control, I guess. Yeah, that's, that works, right? Uh, we import constants and we can OR them together with the vertical bar, with the bitwise OR to combine attributes in our file locking. So the different attributes that we can use are lock X, which gives us an exclusive lock. An exclusive lock means that nobody else can touch that file while we're using it. Uh, we can get a shared lock, and a shared lock means that nobody else can get an exclusive lock on the file while we're touching it but other people can get shared locks. That might be useful if all we really want to do is read a file and we want to prevent anybody else from getting an exclusive lock that they might use to write to the file. Uh, a non-blocking lock, NB. Now, an NB lock, we can OR in, bitwise OR, into either our exclusive lock or our shared lock, and that makes the locking uh, non-blocking. It will return immediately whether or not it got the lock. Whereas the lock EX 
is going to wait until the end of time if that's how long it takes to finally get the lock. And then the last one, the last lock mode is lock on, which is simply releasing a lock. So let's get some several different examples. Now let's assume that above each of these lines of code, we're actually opening a file first, and the file handle really, FH really does point to something, really does point to a file. So in the first example, we're getting an exclusive blocking lock, or die. In the next example down here, we're getting an exclusive lock non-blocking. And that's what the OR operator is doing there for us, bitwise OR. In the third example, we're getting a shared lock, and we could just as easily also OR in the non-blockingness if we wanted to. And in the fourth example, we're using unlock. But let's talk for just a, me just a moment about unlock. You probably don't need unlock. Anybody know why? Yeah, when you close the file, the lock's going to drop off anyway. And it turns out, uh, if you were to use unlock and keep the file handle around, some programmer who might even be yourself in a week might end up using that handle for something else accidentally, and, and the, the lock is gone, and you've just caused a catastrophe, maybe. Um, in really old pearls, and I don't really know how old they would have to be, but at, at least in 5.6, I think, uh, when you close the lock, it would not flush the output buffer. And so if you had code, if you had uh, output that was still buffered, it may not get flushed and could get flushed when you close the handle. And at that point, you've also maybe caused a catastrophe. So, uh, and I don't, I don't know when that improvement was provided. I, I'm sure that it was in place in 5.8. I'm not so sure in 5.6, but. Uh, a call to close file handle flushes the handle and unlocks and closes and does it all at one time atomically. And we don't have to think about when to unlock. So the point is that uh, mistakes can lead to a garbled file. And so you probably don't need to use unlock under ordinary circumstances. There are extraordinary circumstances where it is useful to use unlock, but it's often not necessary. Almost all the time it's not necessary. Just close the file handle, let the, let the handle be flushed, and let the lock drop off when the file handle closes. Any questions so far? No? Pretty easy? Yeah, go ahead. That was not locked at all. So I so I, I spun off three forks and I allowed them to indiscriminately write to the same file at the same time. And so there was no locking going on. And we'll look at a locked example uh, a little later of the same, the same code. So good question. So known issues. There are many issues with locking. And the first one is that locks are unfortunately advisory. Which means that the only way to know if the door is locked is to check the door. And if you're not checking to see if the door is locked, you'll never know. You can just barge right on in. And that doesn't, that's not only a Perl issue, it's basically at the operating system level. Most operating systems do not uh, enforce, uh, do not enforce the locks. So you can check for the locks, you can ask is there a lock, and if there is, then don't proceed. But, you're, but you have to rely on the fact that everybody else is behaving themselves as well. Uh, an example that I had uh, a few weeks ago was we were trying to update the sudoers file on servers that potentially had dozens of people working on them at the same time. If the same call, if, if one person as a, just a general user was updating his entry in the sudoers file at the same time that our automations maybe were updating the sudoers file, we could cause a race condition pretty easily, or a collision. So that's just an example. The user is unlikely to check for a lock, right? How would he even do that? Uh, whereas in the automation, we're obviously checking for the lock, but there's no guarantee that we don't have a user that's, that's also met messing around in the same file. So locks are advisory. Uh, and here's an example of that. Here we are nicely behaving ourselves. Uh, we're going to open a file that we know exists. We're going to open it in rewrite mode. And let's assume that we seek to wherever we want to be or that we're just going to 
uh, rewrite the entire file, fine. We close the file handle and we're done. The lock falls off when we close the file handle and everything's hunky-dory. Except that somebody else wrote this script alongside it that's also running and this is opening the same file in append mode and it's not doing any lock checking. And so it is perfectly free to, to write to the file at the same time that we're rewriting it. And it's anybody's guess who's going to win or what the state of the file will be in the end. So we, we just uh, split our atom, right? Uh, so another thing, another known issue is to always check the return value. So I've mentioned that lock will sit around forever waiting for, lock exclusive will sit around forever waiting for its lock. So why would you ever or die, right? Why would you ever do that? Why would you ever check the return value? Well, because between open and flock, someone could very well have deleted the file. Between the time that you open and get a file handle and then, uh, and then, and then you get your lock, something else could have happened in the meantime. You haven't, your lock is not, the file is not yours until you've gotten your lock, right? Uh, the file system could have gone offline. Uh, until we have the lock, an eternity exists in CPU time during which bad jokes can catch us. Uh, the next kind of known issue is that file open modes are tricky. Does anybody see what's wrong with this one? Here's some nice code that looks like it's behaving itself really well. We're going to open a file for output that we're going to lock and before we do anything else. So that's behaving pretty well, right? So what's the problem? Any guesses? Yeah. We guess that it works the file before That's absolutely right. We've just clobbered that file. We don't know if we own the lock on it. We opened the, fi the file in clobber mode, in output mode. That's, that's the first and foremost problem is that you may have just clobbered a file that somebody else thinks they have a lock on. Yeah, go ahead. I can guess what's the solution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, we're going to talk about that. Unfortunately, there's not an easy solution. There are many, there are many solutions that can, I shouldn't say there's not an easy solution. There's no general case solution, but in specific, each specific use case, there's ways of dealing with it. Um, another possible problem, so the first one is that the file uh, could already be locked by somebody else and, and we clobbered it. The other one that we don't know is, we don't know if we created the file or not. Now, if we're good, uh, good citizens in our, uh, file systems ecosystem, if we created a file and something went wrong, then we probably by all rights ought to clean up after ourselves and maybe remove the file. But we never had a lock. We don't know if we created the file, if somebody else created it. Uh, and so it would not be right to clean it up after ourselves either. So we're, we, it, it's, it just turns out to be really messy. We just clobbered the output file. The flock happened too late, basically. Um, so it's never okay to open in clobber mode with flock. It simply isn't okay. Now somebody's gonna, some, there, there might be a language layer who says, wait, technically if you, no, most of the time, at least every situation I can think of, it's not really okay to open in clobber mode. And if, it's, if it is, I'd like to know. But, um, so uh, Mark Jason Dominus in his talk, he says it's like taking a dump on someone's doorstep and, and then ringing the doorbell and asking for toilet paper when you open the file in clobber mode and then ask for the lock on it. So, and that, that is actually the pile of poo uh, uh, Unicode <laughs> graphing there. So, yeah. um, I don't think that existed when he first gave his talk. So how about this instead? Now we're gonna open in append mode and then we'll obtain a lock and then we'll seek to the beginning of the file and then we'll truncate. Uh, so, so that's, quite similar, we can create a file, we can open it. If we get the lock, then we can seek to the beginning and clobber the file. But we still don't know if we created the file. Append mode still could have created the file. And if we have a failure at any point, do we clean up the file that we just created or do we leave it on the system? We don't really know. There's still plenty of time between open and flock there for somebody else to have created the file and done something to it out from under us. Um, Someone else has the lock, may have the lock. It's, it's, so this is a messy, another messy situation. So how about this? This is a common one, and this is one that, um, that Mark actually puts in his talk. Uh, so we're gonna open the, fo the, the file in read-write mode, read plus write mode, 
and then we're going to obtain a lock. And that's a great solution if you know that the file exists. But it's going to fail if the file doesn't exist because that particular open call, you can try it yourself, uh, will throw an exception, or not throw an exception, it'll return you know, failure. Uh, if, you, if you try to open a file that doesn't exist, it will never create the file. So how about this one? Is there a problem with this? Oh, actually, I told you what the problem is at the bottom. If the file exists, then we go ahead and open it, and otherwise we, let's see, that's backwards. If it doesn't exist is what it really should be, then we go ahead and open it, otherwise we, if it does exist, we can open it in read mode. But what's the problem here? Well, we still have a race condition. Something can change by the time, between the time that we do the dash E and the time that we open the file. So going back to, so Mark's example works really, really well if we know that the file already exists. Um, so until we lock, the file can change. Uh, we can seek after obtaining the lock. Seek, uh, and so I wanted to, oh, before I go onto this slide, I wanna talk about one other thing. And we'll get to this again in a minute, but you asked what another good solution could be. And one solution is using sysopen, because sysopen allows you to gain fine-grained control over whether or not you will open the file in create mode or open it in do not create mode. Uh, it gives you fine control. Another solution could be to touch the file and just say and just accept the fact that uh, accept the fact that we may or may not have created a file on the file system. It, you kind of there isn't a great solution in uh, in some of the BSD flavors. I think probably all of them. Sysopen gives the ability to obtain a lock at the exact time that you obtain the file handle opened. But that's just one operating system or one, you know, it's a large operating system, but Linux doesn't allow you to do that. And Mac OS X, I don't think does, and uh, certainly Windows doesn't. So you, you kind of do have to know what, the, what your particular use cases are to make the decision. Uh, here's another one. Until we lock, the file can change. So if you are opening a file, say, in append mode, and then you obtain a lock, you don't know if the file has already been appended to before you obtained the lock. So your file handle, your, your, the pointer that your file handle represents could be pointing to a position in the file that's not the end of the file. So always make sure to, if you're in append mode, if you're trying to append to a file, always make sure to seek. Uh, here we're seek setting, which is seeking to the beginning of the file. So let's talk about a second about seek. Seek is used to seek within the file to where you want to be seek file handle offset and then whence whence can be seek set which means whence the beginning of the file um, seek end means the end of the file and seek cur i'm not sure what that's useful for it means that it's the current position that we are within the file it's probably useful because seek returns uh returns where you are and so you can use seek set to keep track of where you currently are and come back to it later right um, so most operating systems other than BSD do not provide atomic open and lock natively. Uh, sysopen can help sometimes. Uh, sysopen provides uh, open and read only, open and read write, open and write only. And then you can or in or mix in, uh, create, exclu exclusive, uh, trunk or append. Exclusive sounds great. That sounds like you're maybe locking, right? No, you're not, it's not locking. Exclusive means that if the file already exists, don't open. Right? It means that you must, oh, no, I'm sorry, it means that it's the opposite. Create, you know, that's right. Create is to create the file. Exclusive means, uh, means to not open if the file exists. Um, so in other words, don't create, don't, don't allow the create to happen, so. So here we are using sysopen on the file handle and read, uh, in write only, exclusive, or truncate. So this one, we're not going to create the file and we're gonna fail if, we, if the file doesn't exist. Perfect. And the next one, we're going to create the file. But we still are not an atomic operation. We still, even though we think we may have created a file here, uh, we still can't be sure that we, by the time we get the lock, it still could have been created by someone else. 
So there's no great general solution. Car targeted solutions can be crafted to try exclusive and fall back to create. Uh, there's always still going to be a little bit of a potential race condition unless we can be sure that the file previously existed. Uh, one, good, one good solution, another one that Mark proposed in his talk years ago was to open a known semaphore file. So this is very useful. Um, here we're going to open a file in clobber mode, and this is a case where it's okay to maybe to do so, right? Uh, open the file in clobber mode or die, and then get a lock on that file, and, and then go ahead and open some other fi file, and go ahead and write the, to the second file, to the, to, to the true, true target. So what have we done? Well, anybody that knows to look at the semaphore file for a lock will then know not to touch the true target file. Now we don't care if we've created a file on the file system. You could create the semaphore file in a temp directory and remove it at the end, for example, as long as you have a lock on it. Um, so this is one way of going ahead and opening a file and doing something with it and knowing that you're the one that either created or, you know, once you, once you have the semaphore lock, you can do whatever you want. You can take a week to open the, the true target file if you want, as long as everybody's checking the semaphore file. So that works great unless nobody's looking at the semaphore. And this is another problem that can, can often come up, especially in systems programming where a lot of people could be trying to touch the same file. Uh, a well crafted process might know that it's supposed to be looking at a semaphore, but the user that's logged on to the same box might have no idea that you use that solution. And so it only works in as much as all of the processes are well behaved and are looking at the correct semaphore file. Uh, another way to kind of skirt the issue is to simply just use temp files. Don't, don't rely on a file of a particular name. Use file temp, get a temp file that's, uh, that's virtually guaranteed to be unique. Do your work in that temp file. So sometimes, and then you can combine it with rename to atomically move the temp file to its permanent home later on. So sometimes you can actually avoid the locking instance, the locking issue. Um, I wanted to go ahead and show the example code of how we fixed the race condition. So this is virtually the same code that I showed you earlier on. I'm still using parallel fork manager and we don't really care that, we're, that, that we've got race conditions up here because that's not the point of the, of the script. Down here, we're going to uh, open the file handle in append mode, but we're going to obtain an exclusive lock. We're gonna to seek to the beginning of the file. And then we're going to go ahead and write to the file. Let's go ahead and run this. Actually, let's seek to the end. This will take a little bit longer because we haven't removed our little bit of our sleeps here and there, our micro sleeps. And now we have assured that only one process can write to the file at a time and it must do its complete write. And you can see here that I've got all of my emoji together. Let's scroll back. All of my numbers together and all of my letters together. I don't have any control over which one actually came first, but at least they're all together. We can look at the code again on how I did that. Um, we get our exclusive lock in our sub process. So first we fork off the process then we get an exclusive lock and seek to the end of the, of the file that we've opened. And then we go ahead and print out all of the data that we have to print. And then we close our file handle, which results in the file lock being, being closed down. Once we've closed the file handle, then one of the other three processes that we spun out is free to do whatever it wants with the file. And in the meantime, the other processes are just kind of waiting their turn. So it's not terribly efficient, but it's, but we've assured that we can all, that we're not going to get file corruption. Any question? Any questions on that code? Uh, 
do you have the code available somewhere? Oh, I'll put it up on SlideShare after, and I'll, um, let me think. Um, how will I communicate that? I'll think about it for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so how about here's another problem. This one is kind of moving away from file locking. We want to talk about processes. Let's say you have an hourly cron that can take, uh, it can possibly take quite a while to run. It may even take longer than an hour, but you only want it to run one, at one time at a time. You don't want to run two of them at a time. So you only want one instance. So here's a really slick solution, and this is Mark Jason Dominus's, Dominus's cool trick number one. Um, lock the program's source code file. So get a lock on yourself, essentially. If I can lock the source code file, which is what we're doing, open, open self is just a file handle, opening in read mode, dollar zero is, is me, my pro, is my own f source code file. If I can get a lock on it, then go ahead, keep going. Otherwise, uh, exit. So that, that's kind of cool. I thought that's a great trick. Make sure that only one of me is running at a time. And uh, there was some stuff I was trying to solve a few weeks ago where this would have worked out just great, except that the processes were, um, the processes were running from multiple servers hitting us over SSH and pushing code over. And so anyway, it, was, it didn't work out. But anyway, uh, here's another cool trick. And this is essentially achieving the same thing. Don't even use $0, just flock your own data handle. And that achieves the same thing. You don't even have to open a file. You just can flock your data handle. And if you do that, you've obtained a lock on your source file. And you're safe to proceed. You're the only, pro you're the only one of you running. Any questions? OK. So some takeaways. Uh, don't ignore locking, because if you're ignoring locking, you're not playing nice with your neighbors. Somebody else, hopefully, is locking. And by looking for their lock, you can avoid clobbering the file or the resource. Um, it's hard, but it's usually possible to do it right. Uh, semaphores are just an excellent way of dealing with locking when you need to span, when you need to open a file for output. Uh, the one problem being that not everybody looks at the semaphore, unfortunately. But if you have an agreement somewhere that, that we're going to use a semaphore file, then it's an excellent way. Uh, locks are advisory. <coughs> um, own your own resources. So in C++, there's this term resource acquisition, resource R-A-I-I, -I. resource acquisition is initialization. And it's really just an ugly way of saying that if you instantiate an object, if you create something, then you own it. And so when it comes to files, keep track of if you created a file. And keep track of if it's safe for you to remove the file when you're done. If there's a possibility that somebody else created it between the time that you opened it and locked it, then you're not safe to remove it. And you need to kind of look at your solution a little more closely and see how you want to handle that. And probably the solution is a semaphore. Use atomic operations. You can craft atomic operations by using lock to, to stop time, essentially. Um, and often you can avoid issues altogether by using temp files rather than relying on a specific file somewhere on the file system. And um, in summary, there's an eternity between each line of code filled with bad jokes. So, so I'll open it up to questions. Yes? Yeah. Yes. So Is to create a, a symbolic link to to the semaphore file. Well, that's a good idea, an excellent idea. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I'll, report, I'll repeat that back, that creating a symbolic link is an atomic operation. You can create, uh, you can create a sim link to the semaphore file uh, because that's an atomic operation and get a lock on the symbolic link. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Good solution. I like hearing solutions because this is honestly a hard problem and uh, Jace back there knows because he saw me pacing around the building for like a week figuring out some really tough ones. And yes, David. Great, wonderful, yes. Oh wait, let me repeat that back because we're you know on the mic. So Dave Golden in the back here mentioned Path Tiny, and that Path Tiny gives us for free many of the uh, many nice convenient wrappers around all of the ugliness that can be file locking. Is that a fair paraphrasing? Yes, good. So Path Tiny, yes, go ahead. They're not advisory, so they are enforced locks, similar to BSD. Yeah. So you, or no, you similar to, yeah. You no longer delete the file or edit it or you know, any of those other things you might want to do to a file program is holding the file. Yeah. And that's why, that's why that, that early slide showed all of those, um, all of those, all those examples were in Windows of, you know, so the, the point was made that in Windows, locks are not advisory. They are essentially strictly enforced by the operating system and I guess we do see that from time to time where some, we'll think that some process is maybe exited, but for some reason the process is sticking around and the lock is open and nobody else can touch the file until you've rebooted the system, right? Yeah. So, okay. Anything else? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So is, is it better, can you unlock first and then close? Actually, you don't, so the, the question, let me kind of restate it to make sure that I understand it, and that is, let's, let me try to simplify it a little. Let's try, let's say that you have opened a, a, a semaphore file and tried to obtain, obtain a lock to it, and you could not get the lock for whatever reason, and so then you close the file and you unlink it. No? Go ahead. No, no, I have multiple workers, so <laughs> Okay. 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 So that's a good question. One. Uh, so how do you clean up the semaphore files? You've got multiple semaphore files open. Uh, you can unlink a file while you, while it's still open. And so if you unlink it while it's still open, you still own the lock on it while you've un and you've unlinked it. When you close the file handle, the lock then expires, but you've done the close, you've done the unlink while you still owned the file. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Uh, anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Anything else? Okay, I guess we're done a couple minutes early. Thank you everybody for coming and uh, I will get my slides up on SlideShare and perhaps I'll tweet out a link or something like that. So uh, just come talk to me after and I'll, okay. yeah, sure. Thanks.